This narrated PowerPoint walks you through the chapter Immigration to Canada, New Faces in the Crowd, from Vesevold Isidou's Understanding Diversity, Ethnicity, and Race in the Canadian Context, published by Thompson Educational Publishing in 1999. The chapter is an overview of the history of immigration to Canada. Mr. Isidou has broken the history of immigration to Canada down into eight phases in order to be able to examine them. The first phase is before Europeans settled in Canada. The second phase is from 1600 until the defeat of New France by the British in 1759. The third phase is 1760 until the War of 1812 with the United States. The third phase is 1812 to the opening of the West of the British North America period. I've got opening in uh, quotation marks here because uh, what opening is kind of a euphemism for is starving and driving um, indigenous peoples off the prairies um, so that uh, European farmers could settle there. The fifth period is 1880 until World War I, so 1914 to 1918. The sixth period is between the World Wars from 1921 until 1939. The seventh period is from the end of World War II, so that would be 1945 until 1967. And then the final period is from 1968 when Canada introduced the merit point system until 1999. So before Europeans came here, who were the people on this landmass that we now call Canada? They were the native people, Indians, First Nations, generally we say indigenous these days. There were about 80 to 100 different ethnic groups. Many of them were migratory, meaning they were basically nomadic. There were also the Inuit people in the Arctic. And these groups, they had battles, um, they had alliances uh, and, uh, and occasionally conflict and lots of trade, um, but no one group dominated or ruled over another group. Eurocentric scientists think that Inuit people came to North America sometime around 8,000 before the Common Era, and Indians, uh, or the indigenous people further south, uh, came around 40,000 before the Common Era, um, but there's no certainty around this. The histories of indigenous peoples themselves say that they've been here since creation, and some recent archaeological discoveries suggest that they have been here since at least the last Ice Age, if not before. Altogether, historians estimate an indigenous population of about 220,000 in Canada at the time of conquest. These people often governed themselves with consensus government. Um, we use democracy most of the time. Um, and uh, democracy, though, is majority rule. Consensus is when everyone agrees. Um, so they would uh, basically talk things out uh, until they came to a solution that everyone could get behind. Most of these groups held women in high esteem. Um, ancestry was generally recorded matrilineally. Um, they didn't really care who your father was. Uh, it was who your mother and your grandmother were that were relevant. And uh, they used oral history to record their history, stories, and traditions. So what about Columbus? Um, Columbus uh, was before um, the, the 1600s when Samuel de Champlain arrived in Canada. Um, so he's not terribly relevant to the history of Canada. Um, and the uh, Arawaks, uh, in the first place he landed, uh, Guanahini, um, thought that he was nuts. They thought that he was obsessed with gold and slaves and that there was something kind of wrong with him. Um, the conservative estimate of the number of indigenous people in the Americas uh, when Columbus arrived uh, is 10 million. Uh, there have been higher estimates up to 100 million. Um, and this number was reduced to approximately 30,000 um, by 1900. Indigenous people in the Americas were killed by diseases. Um, many of the diseases that Europeans had were unfamiliar to them, so they had no immunities like smallpox. Um, uh, many of them were worked to death. Uh, the Portuguese and the Spanish uh, used uh, the native people as slaves. 
Um, many of them died, uh, they were out and out murdered by Europeans um, or they died in wars. Many of these wars were actually rebellions um, against colonization. Um, and some groups actually committed mass suicide rather than be under a European rule. And some groups decided not to have children because their children would just become slaves. The second period is 1600 to the defeat of New France, uh, which is 1759. The French initially settled very slowly. So 1660, uh, there were only 2000 French settlers. By 1700, however, there were 15,000. This was largely due to the work of Jean Talon. He was uh, the first intendant of New France. Um, he was given his position by uh, Louis XIV. Um, and uh, he did a very good job of attracting people to New France. He came up with all these schemes. Um, the most famous one is the, the Fille du Roy. Um, so one of the things that was distressing the Catholic Church um, was that uh, French men who were in New France slash Canada um, were uh, hooking up with marrying, um, although it wasn't always church sanctified weddings, um, native women, uh, indigenous women. Um, and the Catholic Church uh, was quite a racist organization. Um, and uh, the, the bishops had a problem with this. Um, and so Jean Talon um, convinced the king uh, to allow uh, numerous, uh, basically poor French women um, to be selected and given a dowry by the king. Uh, so dowry is like a bride price. And the dowry in this case was a chest, a wooden chest. Um, filled with linens and other things that uh, women at the time might need to set up a home. Um, and these women were shipped over to New France um, to be brides for the men who were there. So because the dowry was provided by the king, um, they were called the daughters of the king, the Fille du Roy. Um, so by 1760, because of this and other uh, schemes of Jean Talon, um, there were 60 to 70,000 French settlers. This period is the period that saw the beginning of the fur trade, so the sort of beginning of um, European or capitalist economic activity. Um, the first workers were members of the indigenous bands, so folks uh, from the Ojibwe group, uh, the Chippewa, Cree, um, and others. Um, and many, as I said, of the French men ended up marrying native women. The French set up the first reservations. Um, the first one was actually set up by uh, a Catholic bishop outside of Montreal. Um, and the hope was to assimilate indigenous people into French culture and the Catholic religion. So this is the first instance in Canadian history of ethnic stratification. So that's one of your concepts for this week. Um, who would have been uh, dominating whom in this case? It was the French on top. Right, and uh, the indigenous people on the lower level of the ethnic stratification system. So this picture uh, is uh, a painting. Uh, it's a depiction of the death of the British general, General Wolfe, um, after the Battle of the Plains of Abraham. Um, so this battle was actually a very short battle. Um, it was the end of a long siege uh, and uh, the British won. Uh, and in winning, they won control over this chunk of land that we now call Canada. Um, so please note that uh, in the picture, it's not all just European folks. Um, so here you have uh, General Wolfe himself um, dying. Uh, you know he's the British general because he's in a red coat. The British wear red coats. Um, but you also have uh, a few indigenous folks in this image. There's a few more in the background, right? Um, and part of why I wanted to show you this is to point out the fact um, that uh, Britain had indigenous allies uh, who fought with them in this, this war. Um, and the French also had indigenous allies who fought with them in this floor, war. And some historians argue um, that it was actually the, the indigenous allies who sort of determined the course of the battle, determined who won and who lost. So now the British are in charge of uh, this chunk of land that we're calling Canada today. So the French were the established settlers and the British became the second colonizers. So we have another change to the ethnic stratification system. So now we have indigenous people on the bottom, the French in the middle, and the British are on top of the ethnic stratification system. 
So Lord John Simcoe became the governor uh, of uh, Upper Canada um, and he arrived here and took a look around and he saw lots of French people and lots of indigenous people um, and realized that if he was going to hold this territory for Britain, he needed a lot more folks uh, who were uh, either British or loyal to the British king. So uh, fortuitously, uh, in 1776 until 1783, um, south of us in the United States, um, which was not the United States until 1783, um, there were 13 British colonies along um, the eastern seaboard south of us. Um, and these colonies rebelled against Britain um, and, uh, and uh, the American Revolutionary War ensued. Um, not everyone in the United States wanted to get away from British control, wanted to stop being a British colony. So some people fought uh, on the British side um, and supported the British side. These people were called loyalists. When the British lost and the United States became the United States, um, these people were not terribly popular with their neighbors. Um, and many of them were also wanting to continue living in a British colony. So Lord Simcoe sent messengers down um, to these 13 now states, no longer colonies, um, and uh, told basically with a message that the loyalists were welcome to come up to Canada, that they would be given free land as a reward for their loyalty to the British king, um, and that they could settle again in a British colony. So that's who the loyalists were. So the population began to grow. So in 1791, there were 14,000 people in Upper Canada. And by 1811, there were 90,000. Um, most of these people were English. Um, some of them were Loyalists, some were French, some were German and some were Scottish. So this is a picture of a Métis home. Um, it's uh, from 1870. Um, I'm jumping a little bit forward in time because we're going to talk about the Métis in a minute. And I wanted you to see um, sort of a little bit about how they lived. So you can see uh, this is a fairly large building um, and it would have been uh, in the Red River Valley. So the area uh, that we now call Winnipeg in uh, what we now call Manitoba. Um, and uh, this was a multi-generational home. All right. So uh, the people who you can see in the picture lived here um, and probably more. Uh, so it would have been an entire extended family. Um, You'll notice that there are uh, there's a stone chimney here. Um, that chimney would have had it would have been a big fireplace and had a large hearth um, inside, and it was it would have been open concept. There weren't like separate rooms in most of these homes. Um, it was kind of a cross between a pioneer log cabin um, and the long houses like the Iroquois, um, the Haida, etc. Um, lived in. Um, and uh, so you'll notice uh, that. It's basically made out of wood, so these are logs, right? And um, between the logs, there's mud mixed with straw to keep out the wind. Um, this house is awesome because it has some windows. You can see them back here behind the people in the picture. Um, the windows would not have had glass in them because getting glass uh, all the way to Manitoba at that point in history was incredibly difficult. Um, there were no trains yet um, that went all the way. Um, so it would have been uh, something that uh, looked to us like wax paper. So it, w it let in light, um, but you couldn't really see out through it. Um, so the second little chimney here uh, would have been a cook stove. Um, so this end of the, the home uh, would have been sort of the kitchen area. And out back here, you can see a little fence. Um, and out back here, there was very probably a kitchen garden um, for growing some of the things that they needed immediately to eat. Um, you can see that these folks are dressed in European clothes. And uh, you can see there's a couple of women back here um, in pretty Victorian style outfits. Um, and uh, this is a, a farm cart. All right. So the Métis had their own culture, um, but they uh, their dress for the most part uh, looked like European dress. The only sort of distinctive piece of Métis clothing is the Métis sash, um, which Métis men wear for special occasions. And usually it's a brightly colored sash they wear around their waist that's usually made by female relations for them. Um, the native, uh, the Métis people spoke uh, Métis, which was a mix of Cree and French. Um, and uh, they both farmed and hunted and gathered. Right? So they had their own distinct culture. Uh, the center of Métis culture was in Manitoba, what we now call Manitoba. Um, and uh, they were organized. They had elected their own government, um, etc. So this will become relevant uh, later on. So onward. So uh, in 1812, um, Canada slash British North America won uh, the war 
1812 against the United States of America. So the U.S. had been trying to annex some of the territory that we now think of as Canada, um, and uh, the British troops managed to repel them um, with a great deal of help um, from uh, black folks, uh, many of whom were escaped slaves, um, and some of whom were black loyalists, um, some of whom were veterans of the American Revolutionary War. Um, with uh, the help of indigenous people, um, a number of groups assisted. Um, it's the only time really that Canada ever beat the U.S. militarily. Um, we actually burned down the White House. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, remember that because it's probably never going to happen again. Um, so this victory proved that Britain was going to hold this territory that we now call Canada. Um, this uh, engendered some confidence on behalf of businesses. So uh, the British company, the Hudson Bay Company, um, which had over trapped and kind of wiped out the beaver in Ontario and Quebec nearly completely um, and depleted fur stocks, uh, needed new territory um, to trap and hunt um, because the, the fur trade was still extremely lucrative um, for fur traders. Um, this desire on the part of the HBC fit very well with the desire of the British North American government to open up the West. So what that means is uh, an increasing uh, European population that pushed Indigenous people um, further west and north. So in 1812, um, the BNA government sent uh, a Scottish regiment um, out to the Red River Valley um, to set up settlements. Uh, this completely ignored the fact that this was the center of the Métis world. This was where they had their uh, land uh, and their government, etc. And this decision on the part of the British North American government led to the two Métis rebellions. Um, sadly, the Métis lost both. Um, and in the second one, uh, Louis Riel was captured and he was taken to Ottawa and he was hung. Um, Louis Riel was their leader. Uh, and you can see him and his government uh, right here. So he's the fellow... Uh, right in the center. This is Mr. Riel, right? He was educated in a Catholic seminary. Um, he was a school teacher between the two rebellions. Um, and uh, yeah, his council was democratically elected. Um, the only reason why uh, they were not allowed to kind of continue uh, was that Britain wanted the territory. And I think just out and out racism. There was no way that the British government could recognize uh, a native government. So where did these settlers, these European settlers, come from? How were they attracted to come here? Um, so what you have here uh, is one of the strategies that were used to try and attract um, folks. So this storefront that you can see um, is an immigration office or an immigration agency. Um, and uh, it was a storefront. It was an advertising technique. Those of you who are taking marketing know about that. Um, and if you look, you can see uh, this image here um, is uh, a horse, uh, a couple of big draft horses at plows. Um, this is this other image is a big wheat sheaf, right? So what kind of immigrants are they trying to attract if these are the images they're using, right? They're looking for agricultural immigrants. So the government offered um, free slash cheap land, um, but that was a bit of a scam. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, they opened these uh, storefronts uh, and called them immigration agencies, and they hired these fast-talking fellows who were kind of like used car salesmen to be immigration agents. Um, and these fellows would hang around uh, the ports uh, in cities where people were uh, able to get boats to come across to the New World, um, and they would try and convince particularly young men um, that they wanted to go try and find their fortune in the New World. Um, there was lots and lots of advertising. Um, we'll take a look at some of it and you'll see that like much advertising, it's not necessarily accurate. Um, the government uh, offered uh, to subsidize or assist paying the fare to Canada. So that's assisted passage. Um, groups that were being persecuted in Eastern Europe um, and other places um, like the Hutterites, uh, the Duke of Boys, the Mennonites um, were invited to uh, emigrate together. They were told you can, you can immigrate to Canada as a group, um, you'll get a big chunk of land, you can live and worship the way you want to. Um, and then also uh, they used delegations of VIPs. So just the way that Michael Jordan has been used today to sell Nikes, um, they, uh, they used uh, the folks who were sort of the celebrities of the day who would have been uh, playwrights and novelists for the most part. Um, and they would uh, bring them to Canada 
um, to somewhere very nice in Canada, like Halifax, um, definitely not to Toronto. Toronto was infamous for being uh, muddy and gross. It was called Muddy York. Um, and uh, show them some really nice stuff in the summer and then ship them back uh, to Britain uh, or to Europe. And then these very important people, these celebrities would travel around to the small towns, um, all of which had little theaters in them because before TV, that was what you did. Um, and they would make presentations in these little theaters. They'd have maybe a stuffed beaver and a, 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 an indigenous headdress um, and maybe a birch bark canoe or something. And they'd get up on the stage and they'd talk about how wonderful Canada was because of course they weren't there for the winter. Um, they didn't see uh, the thick brush or the, the emptiness of the prairies, etc. cetera. Um, similarly, there were exhibitions. So um, uh, all sorts of sort of Canadian artifacts and sometimes even live uh, indigenous people um, were sort of trucked about to small places. Um, and the point of these exhibits was to advertise the possibility of going to live in the new world. So here we have one of those ads that I spoke to you about. Um, and uh, I've already circled uh, some of the areas that I wanted you to pay attention to. All right, so um, up here, you can see these depictions of these lovely, lovely farms, right? Um, so just to be clear, this one says it's in Manitoba. This one says it's in the Northwest Territory, which is uh, Saskatchewan, Alberta. Um, and uh, when this was printed, there is no way that there were farms that looked anything like this in Manitoba or in Saskatchewan or Alberta. Um, maybe in Nova Scotia, which had been settled since the 1600s, you could find uh, places like that, but maybe even not. So please notice, remember we just talked about the Métis, one of the places being advertised is the Red River Valley. This says the great fertile plains of British Columbia. Okay, there's a little bit of fertile plain in British Columbia, but mostly there's a lot of mountain and coast. Um, immense coal fields, climate the healthiest in the world. Uh, some of my friends from the Caribbean would disagree with that. Um, so this is like much advertising, not necessarily accurate. Now the other thing that's not accurate is this free. Um, so what actually uh, was going on was that the government was offering grants of land um, for something uh, called homesteading. Oh, I'm not going to be able to write very neatly with this. Um, but uh, homesteading is not necessarily free land. So what the agreements that people had to sign would say um, would be something like, you know, here's your 100 acres. Um, in the next five years, you have to clear uh, two thirds of the trees off of this land and you have to build two buildings, right? And um, this was a condition of the land being free. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever tried to clear land, um, but it's incredibly difficult. So if you have a forest and you need to take out trees, Right? It's not enough that you cut down the trees, which is enough work if you don't have power tools, and they didn't, right? We're talking hand saws here. Um, but uh, you still can't farm land that's had all the trees cut down, right? What do you have to do in order to farm land? You have to take the stumps out, right? Taking stumps out is incredibly difficult. Nowadays, they have like really big sort of um, kind of crane type things that do this. Um, but uh, it was incredibly arduous work. So clearing two thirds of 100 acres in five years was more than uh, was almost possible. Um, and in places like Ontario in particular, where we had a particularly corrupt government for a while, the family compact, um, lots of people had their land, uh, were starting to farm it, had settled on it, and maybe built themselves a house, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then uh, a government agent would come at the end of the five years and say, hey, look, you haven't, you haven't cleared two thirds. You only built one building. Where's your bar? Um, we're going to take it back uh, and then they would give it to uh, friends of the people in government. All right. So this idea that there was free land is a little bit not accurate. OK, so you'll notice this is all out west. So Manitoba, this is uh, Canadian Northwest is Saskatchewan and Alberta um, and British Columbia. Now, the last thing I want to point out here um, is who sponsored this. So there's uh, two sponsors listed here, the High Commissioner for Canada. That's kind of like the Department of Immigration today, the Department of the Interior. So they were the people who were responsible for getting, getting the prairies settled um, under Clifford Sifton, who we'll talk about later. Um, but uh, the, the ad itself was sponsored by the Dominion Line, the Royal Mail Steamships. Right? So this is a steamship company. Why are they sponsoring uh, an advertisement to try and attract people to come to Canada? Well, because if you're going to come to Canada from the UK, you're doing this, right? You're coming across the ocean, probably not in such a squiggly line. Um, 
And uh, that means that there are steamships running, right? So uh, they were hoping to make lots of money off the fares. Um, and many of the steamship lines also ran railroad companies in Canada. Um, and so often the, they would uh, loan people the money for the fare, and then when people arrived in Halifax, and this is mostly men, um, they would be put on a train uh, and shipped to where the railroad construction was uh, happening and told, okay, you can pay us back by working now, right? So we'll talk more about those workers later on. So in Britain, um, uh, in this period, we're almost 100 years into the Industrial Revolution. Um, in Canada, the Industrial Revolution was later. Uh, it basically started around now, right, in the 1850s kind of thing. Um, the Industrial Revolution, uh, just in case it hasn't been explained to you in your previous studies, um, is the period when um, production moved out of uh, workshops and off of farms um, and into what they initially called manufactories and then eventually called factories. Um, and uh, the Industrial Revolution was a very, a time of a lot of change um, and uh, a lot of de-skilling, um, a lot of displaced people, uh, etc. So in the cities, the conditions for working people were frankly just awful. Um, and uh, there's just a lot of upheaval and change. Okay. So Britain used immigration to their colonies as a way of dealing with their domestic problems. So um, unemployment was rampant um, and then that meant poverty and then there were lots of petty crimes born of poverty because there's no social assistance, there's no EI at this point in history. Um, so uh, there were lots of pickpockets, people would steal food, etc, etc. Um, in 1846 to 1847, um, there, were, uh, there was a quote-unquote famine in Ireland. Now, that's quote, in quotation marks because there's some debate among historians about whether or not it's legitimately called a famine. What happened was in 1846, the potato crop um, in Ireland failed. Now, in Ireland was the first place that Britain colonized. They kind of practiced on Ireland. Um, and so in Ireland, there were kind of two groups. Um, one was sort of the native Irish, um, and they were mostly Catholic, and they were mostly poor, um, and they subsisted on potatoes. Um, and then there were um, the Protestants, um, who were often somewhat British descended, um, who were often landowners, who were often wealthier, um, and uh, they often still had food during this time. Um, in fact, some of the big Protestant farms were actually shipping produce to England during the so-called famine um, while the native Irish were starving to death. Um, so during the quote-unquote famine, um, more than 100,000 Irish immigrants crossed the ocean to the New World. Um, many of them would go on to the United States, which was more developed than Canada. Um, many died on the ships because the ships were just basically a breeding ground for infection and you have people already weakened by starvation. Um, so that was one of the big influxes of immigration. So the population of Upper Canada just continues to climb. So um, in 1812, it's 90,000. By 1838, it's 400,000. And by 1881, you've got 4,324,810 people. Please notice that the 1881 number is quite a bit more um, detailed and accurate. So what do you think happened in 1880, 1881? How do you get detailed population numbers? You do a census. Right, so the census in 1881 um, suggested that there were about 59% British people, 30% French, 2.5% um, uh, Indigenous people. Now, uh, I'm going to come back to talking about that in a sec, and 8.6 other. So when I saw this statistic in the reading, um, I actually contacted a friend of mine who teaches Indigenous studies in Manitoba um, and asked if, if she thought this was an accurate number um, for the time period. Um, and, uh, and she said uh, it probably wasn't. Um, she said that by 1880, um, Canada was uh, officially a country, right? Canada became a country in 1867. Um, the, uh, the Indian Act had been passed. And the Indian Act is one of the most racist pieces of legislation you will ever see. Um, it basically says that Native people are children, um, uh, stupid children, and uh, the Canadian government can do whatever they want with them. Um, so by this point in time, she said uh, Native people were well aware um, that uh, white folks did not have their best interests at heart. And so when the white guys with clipboards arrived in their communities to take census, um, she guesses um, that they did not 
all line up to be counted. She says probably some people hid, um, probably uh, the census takers were so racist they couldn't tell one native person from another, um, so they didn't count well, um, etc. Right? So she figures this number should actually be quite a bit higher. So this period was a period of first. So this is the period when the first Chinese um, came to Canada. Um, they didn't come straight from China. They actually came up from California, um, hoping to make their fortunes um, in the gold rush in the Fraser River Valley um, in the 1850s. Um, Chinese uh, people were in California for gold. Um, uh, they uh, were subject to a lot of um, brutality. Um, so uh, often Chinese miners, um, if they found gold on their stake, um, would uh, get mugged basically by white miners who would steal what they had found. Um, sometimes white miners stole their stakes if they thought the stake is the area that you can mine. Um, you buy that area and then you, are, you get mineral rights for it. Um, and, uh, and so the Chinese miners got really good at figuring out how to avoid the white miners, right? So they would either try and get right away first to places where gold had been found, um, or they would uh, end up mining stakes that white folks had already abandoned. Um, and often because of their hard work and their persistence, they would find more gold than the white folks had, um, et cetera. So uh, uh, groups of Chinese gold miners came up to BC from California in the 1850s. This is also the period of the Underground Railroad. So the Underground Railroad, as we'll talk about next week, was not a real railroad. It didn't have tracks and trains, um, but it was a network of uh, people who believed that slavery was wrong. Many of them were Quakers. Um, some of them were free blacks uh, and they uh, would help uh, escaped slaves who escaped from plantations in the American South um, to get up first to the American North, but then after 1851, uh, when the uh, Fugitive Slave Act uh, had uh, black folks who were found uh, in the northern United States returned to the south. Sometimes they weren't returned, sometimes they were abducted and sent to the south anyway. Um, then uh, people came on onwards to Canada from then on. Um, so the Underground Railroad uh, helped escaped slaves get to freedom in Canada. So by 1860, there were 50,000 blacks in Upper Canada. Um, in 1863, um, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Act ending slavery in the United States. And in 1871, um, there were only uh, 21,500 black folks left in Upper Canada. Um, so historians figured that many of them um, returned to the United States after emancipation. Um, the sad uh, truth is that although they could be free in Canada, um, there was still an incredible amount of uh, anti-black racism um, in Canada. Often uh, they couldn't buy land, um, business owners wouldn't deal with them. Um, yeah, they weren't allowed to go to the same schools as white kids, uh, etc. Okay, so another first um, was that a group of Sioux Indians um, who were fleeing the American army um, ended up uh, finding refuge in Canada. Um, so uh, the story of the Sioux uh, is an extremely interesting story. Um, and uh, the Battle of Little Bighorn um, was a uh, a kind of a debacle for the American military. So General Custer, um, who's gone down in history as a terrible general, um, had intel that suggested that uh, the Sioux warriors were off at a, a war meeting um, and that uh, the camp that he uh, he was near um, only had uh, the the older people, um, the, the children um, and the women who did not fight because there were women warriors among uh, the indigenous people. Um, and, uh, and so his troops attacked um, this encampment. Um, his intel was bad. Uh, it turned out that actually the war meeting was at that camp. Um, and so uh, the, the, his troops were basically slaughtered. Um, it was a, a complete victory for the Sioux and a huge loss for the American military. Um, and if you beat the American military, they come after you. Um, so Chief Sitting Bull knew that uh, his people would be in danger. So he led them up uh, to what we now call Alberta, the Northwest Territories, um, and, uh, and asked for amnesty from the Canadian government. Um, so 4,000 of his people came with him um, in 1876 and 1877, um, and uh, they were granted uh, a chunk of land um, and, uh, and some rations. Now, there weren't nearly enough rations, uh, and the chunk of land was terrible and couldn't support them. So after a few years, they were basically starving, um, and uh, Chief Sitting Bull made the difficult decision to go back um, to the United States and took most of his people with him. Uh, a very small number stayed.
So uh, I couldn't find any photos of two sitting below. I'm not sure there are any, um, but I did find this artist's rendition. Um, if you ever get a chance to read up on Chief Sitting Bull and the story of the Sioux, um, it's actually fascinating. Um, sitting Bull was a brilliant military um, tactician uh, and a very uh, good leader and a good speaker. Okay. So in this period, the tone of immigration to Canada is basically set. So from then on, there is a constant influx of immigrants into Canada. I would say now under COVID is about the only time that that has uh, in any way massively slowed down or halted. Um, many of these immigrants come with economic motives. They want to make better lives. All right. And then some of the others come with political motives. So they're refugees. They're fleeing something awful. And um, always the British uh, are in the top strata of the hierarchy of immigrant groups. So this means that the British have the most, what term are we using to talk about this? Ethnic stratification.